Uh, I am just delighted to be on the stage with these two, uh, as Eric called them, elder statesmen. I think they might uh, prefer a different title to that, but certainly these two men were a force in the Kentucky General Assembly. I came on scene in 1997, and they were a force to be reckoned with. And I'm glad to have this kind of re, uh, reunion with them today to hear about CARA, what inspired the legislation, the problems before it. To give you all a primer, many of you, as Eric said, may have been very young at the time uh, that that measure was signed into law. And so hopefully to give you some background about the importance of that landmark decision of the Rose decision the resulting Education Reform Act, and then that will help you really understand where we are today and the challenges that we face in our public education system. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Judge David Williams. He's the former president of the Kentucky Senate. He served Senate District 16 from 1987 to 2012. Uh, when Republicans gained control of the state Senate in 2000, he was selected as Senate president. Prior to that, he was elected to the Kentucky House in 1984 at age 31 at that time making him the youngest member of the House of Representatives. Since 2012, after his resignation from the Senate, he's been a circuit court judge. And in 1990, he was one of the few Republicans who voted for the Kentucky Education Reform Act. And we're going to talk all about that brave move. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Judge David Williams. <laughs> Wherever you'd like to sit, sir. And also, another senator, David Karam, who was elected to the Kentucky House of Representatives in 1972. He moved to the Senate in 1976 and served through 2004, a 33-year tenure, during which time he served as Senate Majority Caucus Chairman and Majority Floor Leader. He served now on the, well, he served on the Education Committee all but six months when he was in the legislature. He's the current chair of the Kentucky Board of Education. Please give a warm welcome for Chairman Senator David Karam. Are you all comfortable? Can we pretend this is like the uh, Jody David press conferences on Friday morning back in the old days uh, of the uh, General Assembly? You remember those, Judge Williams? The, uh, <laughs> pick up your microphone, sir, and let's make sure they work. Well, we're getting off to not a very auspicious start. Senator Karam told me that the only six months he wasn't on the education committees when I kicked him off of it. <laughs> I want to publicly apologize for not taking you off sooner. <laughs> <laughs> so as you all can tell, this is going to be a very riveting, informative, and fun conversation. So uh, these gentlemen have known each other a while, but you haven't seen each other in a while, I understand. It's been a long time. Well, he doesn't come to Berks so often, and I don't leave very often. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we want to really just kind of help folks understand, because you guys were there in the legislature during the Rose decision, during, of course, you were part of the crafting of CARA. But let's talk a little bit about the Rose decision and the conversations that were going on and the problems uh, back in Kentucky's educational system back then that led to the formation of CARA. And I'll start with you, Judge Williams. What did you see as the big problems that you knew just had to be fixed? Well, before, uh, before I start, uh, I would say that there's nothing new in the world. There's nothing new in this business. You know, since the drafting of the present Constitution, there's been a problem as far as distribution of educational funds predicated upon the wealth behind individual students, their location. And people say that the uh, Constitution has not been amended very many times. Actually, our state Constitution that we operate on has been amended at least three times by the public in trying to address the issue of equitable funding uh, the original Constitution called for the money to be distributed on a per capita basis for children, wh wh David, where they were in school or not. That didn't work out uh, very well. And finally, the last uh, amendment to the Constitution, which I think probably in the 50s sometime, uh, allowed the General Assembly to come up with a scheme to do that. And that's where the minimum foundation program came in and then the power equalization. Now, most of you here have not heard the word power equalization before, thank goodness, because no one will ask me to explain it. But I will tell you that power equalization was easier to explain than the minimum foundation program. With Dr. Martin from Eastern Kentucky University, who was our colleague, said, well, the minimum foundation program wasn't meant to be that way. It just ended up being minimum. So this has been an ongoing issue, and uh, I will give someone credit that 
probably his name is not brought up as often as it should be when we talk about the Education Reform Act, and that's Governor Martha Lane Collins. Uh, Governor Martha Lane Collins was there and trying to do education reform, a former school teacher. She's very courageous, but she couldn't succeed herself. And, I, and quite frankly, in retrospect, in reflection, I think she was probably a little guilty of some sexism at the time. She was the first and only uh, female governor, and she had difficult, but she passed a lot of good things. But to, to get to your point. But didn't you vote against, didn't she try some education no, reform? No, I voted for, I, I voted, uh, I, I voted for some of her, uh, for some of her uh, bills, but the problem was that she doesn't have the support to get the financial portion of it passed. And I will tell you, and I think Senator Karen will remember, this was a, a great period of turnover. Not only was she a new governor with a, with a short term uh, left when we were going, but there was a turnover in the Kentucky House of Representatives. There was a coup d'etat over there. And when I, I'm from Berksville, uh, and Bobby, Bobby Richardson from Glasgow was Speaker of the House. Well, there were just like 19 Republicans there then, you know, out of 100. But I had the Speaker was, used to have a coke route that goes through Berksville, and I thought, well, the first thing that happened when I got up there, this group of young Turks who later were the primary movers and shakers in Kentucky Education Reform Act, uh, displaced him and uh, re replaced him with Don Blanford, and uh, Greg Stumbo was, was the floor leader, and all these individuals who are uh, that we talk about, from to Joe Barras, uh, to all these folks that were uh, very much involved were there. So there was an internal problem in the Democratic Party in the House. Do you agree with that? And, and the first thing that these guys did when they took over this new leadership position in the Democratic Party, the other folks that were left out and had lost were not inclined to vote for a tax increase to fund these new programs for these new insurgents. Now that sets the background mm -hmm. for where we are. So that, that's where we were. And in 1984, 85 time period, I was just coming onto the scene up there, which uh, as you said, I, was, I served one term in the house, which was invaluable to me to get to know all these guys and sit on the committees. Uh, if you saw the situation there, there wasn't going to be any uh, sacrifice done by the folks that had gotten kicked out. And all these measures were passed, uh, progressive measures, class size reduction, all those sort of things that, that later became uh, real bones of contention. But there wasn't the political will or the power to go ahead with the money. And when Governor Wilkinson came in, then... Uh, those folks wanted to fund, number one, David and I, as I looked in research, you were quoted pretty frequently, the General Assembly wanted to fund those previously passed education reform issues before they talked about the things that Governor Wilkinson wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that was the major. So this issue, as we frame it, and I turn to Senator Karam, the issue at this point was who was going to control the agenda. Right. Were, were the young Turks and the members of the House going to get all of their uh, their policies funded before we talked about equity and funding, mm -hmm. or was the governor who was more intent upon systemic change rather than addressing individual problems? And, and I, I will offer something before I forget it. If you haven't read it, if you want to know what Governor Wilkinson's perspective, he wrote a book after he left office, and I, I know he had kind of a tough exit from this, but I, I, I do think that this book will tell you about his thought process, and it's, you can't do that, Governor. And it's, his perspective is really, really good. And in one of the things there, he quotes David Karam, speaking to the Southern Regional Education Board, or Education Board of State, saying, you can't have education reform unless you have strong leadership. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, to set this whole thing up, you had the governor, you had the Young Turks, you had a mature and, and, and really competent Senate that was a lot of strong players. Senator Karam was there, Eric Rose was there, Maloney was there. I mean, you had a lot of strong uh, players there, and it was about who's going to control the agenda and where are we going. And in the background of all this, you have the Pritchard Committee out there, you have the council that comes up, you have the litigation going on in Franklin Circuit Court, and everybody waiting for the other shoe to fall as far as what the Supreme Court was going to do. And uh, Robert Stevens was a very politically astute jurist, and, and this... If you look at the Rose case, there wasn't really a defendant in the Rose case. 
to, to, I mean, they were named defendants, but everybody knew what had to be done. So, yeah, Senator Karam. Well, the first thing I want to say is since I have this microphone in my hand, has nothing to do with the topic, and that is nothing directly to do with the topic. But I always, whenever I speak in front of a group of people who work hard, like you do, for the Commonwealth of Kentucky in education, I always want to point out to them I have two sons, both of whom went all the way through the public school system in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, all the way through elementary, all the way through secondary, all the way through high school, got fabulous education in the Commonwealth schools. Uh, both sons now have PhDs. Uh, one from Speed School here in Louisville in computer software engineering and the other from Yale uh, in American literature. And so I thank you all uh, first and foremost for what you do to, for public education. I always think about education reform in the 1990 session, uh, and I think David will agree with this, is this is one of those situations where it's, uh, you always want to say, you better be careful what you ask for. Because it was clear as a bell that what uh, uh, the folks who were filing the lawsuit was about was getting more resources and more resources only. At the same time this was going on in Kentucky, there were states like West Virginia and Texas who, were not do who had the same court situations going on but who refused to do anything about it. And I think one of the things that helped us, Renee, do something about it was looking at that issue of um, those other states doing nothing and here was an opportunity finally for us to uh, shine, if you will. I will recall, I, I very much recall the first meetings where the Senate Democratic leadership uh, met both from the House and the Senate <clears throat> and it won't surprise you that there were a number of those people who said we don't need to be doing anything about it. Uh, the court did it, let the court fix it. And um, there was resistance about uh, doing anything. Uh, far and away, though, and I, a lot of it um, was Joe Wright from uh, down in Breckenridge County, former school board member, who, who said, uh, this is our opportunity to do something the right way, and we just have got to do that. So um, the majority of people in leadership finally uh, bought into the idea that we really needed to do something about it, and that allowed us to propel forward. So people need to understand that it wasn't easy to make that sale. There was a lot of resistance about doing anything. I mean, just let the court, you, you guys messed us up, so um, you fix it. Uh, and then, of course, the other shoe that dropped was the court went way beyond what, uh, what the folks who, who filed these lawsuits wanted. And in fact, David, you probably got some of the same letters and so forth that we all did, where they said, wait a minute, school districts were writing us letters, school board members were writing us letters saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what we're talking about. No, we don't, what, what's this thing about the entire system of common schools is unconstitutional? We want resources. So uh, that was a wonderful, that was a kind of wonderful uh, era where getting the uh, letters from people who were, who were resenting what they even did themselves. Yeah, well, you know, I, yeah go ahead. I really don't think if, if the case had not gone as far as it did, uh, I don't think this would have happened because of what I talked about a few minutes ago, but because the need for those young Turks and the people in the house wanting to pass their agenda, the governor, who was a business person, sort of wanted to do a systemic change, all these consultants that were in, uh, these sort of things that were going on. But I will tell you that there was an, another thing that I feel like, and I remember very well from these, in some of these states there was an issue of whether or not a court ought to dictate to an equal branch of government that you shall raise this amount of tax or you shall raise that amount of tax. And David, I think we wanted to avoid that sort of confrontation. And I think that that was the genius of uh, Judge Corns and, and, and the Supreme Court under the leadership of the Chief Justice to avoid ordering us to do a certain amount of money, but giving us the opportunity to have the shield 
of this court order to say we've got to do something about this. And of course, if you remember, there were all these meetings and everything going on before the money part of it was added later on. Later on, it, it, it was added because the governor wanted to know how much it was going to cost. Nobody knew how much equalization was going to cost, what level we were going to equalize. To And then at the end, if you remember, uh, before the decision came down, there was still an impasse between the leadership and the General Assembly then, maybe to a lesser extent now, was really driven by the leadership uh, in the House and the Senate. Uh, I think it was more so then. Uh, than it was now, but if if you got down to it, there was a doubt as to what the governor was going to do because you mentioned we mentioned Governor Collins. There was an attempt by her uh, under uh, Chairman Clark and Chairman Maloney uh, to uh, conform to the federal tax code, which would have raised about two hundred million dollars or something like that uh, while she was still there. And the governor uh, Wilkinson had been nominated. But uh, he came out against that uh, conforming and against new revenue and took a lot of heat from the editorial boards, the Pritchard Committee, and everyone else. But it was his concept, as he talks about in the book, that he didn't want to spend that money on those things without being able to redesign the system. So he was going to give the money. And what, his, his, what he said, well, I'm not going to raise any new taxes. Well, the new was... The operative word. He, he didn't say he wasn't going to raise some taxes that already existed. He just kind of wanted to go start any new taxes. So we got to that point, and then we came in when he was elected with that situation. There was a complete impasse. And I want to, David to, to get what you have to say about when you, you guys formed the committee and committees, and we went all over the state uh, having these hearings because the governor felt very strongly that only the leadership the consultants and the governor should be involved in these discussions. And the General Assembly, I tell you what they say, I was president of the Senate for a little while, a little over 12 years, and everybody talks about how much authority you have and you might be dictatorial. Well, a good lead goat always looks over his, his or her shoulder to see where the herd's going. Because if the herd takes off in a different direction, you're not the lead goat anymore. And that's the situation that the leadership found themselves in. I mean, it was easy for the governor to say, well, you just provide all these votes. So there, there was a need for them. But he didn't even want the education chair, education committee members to participate. So you guys set up this statewide, this statewide tour that we had. Talk about it. Well, one of the things that was, uh, that was really important was this whole system that was set up at the committees to try to deal with the issue. And a uh, very personal part of it for me was at the time, and the guys from Jefferson County might appreciate this, there was a guy who was a uh, superintendent named Don Ingerson. And Don, I was at that point in Senate leadership and was, as we said, I was a caucus, majority caucus chairman. And at several public meetings, the, the big concern that some of the, in some districts like Fayette, some of the northern Kentucky and, and Jefferson County was, it was going to be Rob Peter to pay Paul. That, that they were, they were we going appreciate to be, it, too. <laughs> that they were going to lose money. And Don Ingerson would go, God love him, rest his soul, Don Ingerson would point to me and say, your job, Karen, is to be absolutely sure that uh, Jefferson County doesn't lose any money in this thing. And so... Um, so when I got a call from Joe Wright's uh, uh, person uh, who, who was helping form these committees, he said, Joe wants you to be on the curriculum committee. There were three committees, curriculum, governance, and the financial piece. And um, I said to the gentleman on the phone, I don't, I'm not going to be on the curriculum committee. I want to be on the... I want to be on the finance committee because I'm going to cover my backside uh, with Don Ingerson and all the people in Jefferson County. And then uh, that call ended fairly abruptly, and the uh, next thing was a call from Joe Wright directly to me. And Joe said, after a 30-minute conversation, not only do you not want to be on the finance committee, you want to be on the curriculum committee, and you guess what? You want to chair it. And so... Uh, the, 
one of the givens at that point, which in, you'd think that David would really just would love me dearly because one of the things that occurred, and he probably does, um, one of the things that occurred was there was a real discussion that there would be this group of people that represented the governor's office and certain legislators only, and um, there was resistance from the members of the education committees, and and they wanted to participate, and so... Um, they were named, uh, the, the leadership agree, understood being led by where the goats were. <laughs> they were going to be ex officio. And, um, I, and David, I hope, will recall that when he, ser he, because he served on the curriculum committee, I said, if these members of the General Assembly are going to spend the same amount of time as any of the committee members in these meetings, they were going to be full participants. They were going to have votes, and uh, we were going to. I don't know that that I don't know that that occurred on the other two committees, but the members of the general assembly who participated in the curriculum committee became voting members of the committee. And God love him, David Williams was one of the most contributing of those members, and um, I've forgiven so many things that he's done over the years because he was so good back then. <laughs> Especially after I came into authority, you didn't enjoy it too much, but I will, I, I will quickly, tell you. Uh, Judge Williams, I do want to ask you about the vote. Let me, let me, add, let okay. me say, now David went to the task force that was created, and I was talking about the legislative committees under Nelson Allen that we did before it became apparent that y'all were going to do a deal. You know, and, I, and that was after things. So we did an entire, I mean, we went everywhere. We got on buses. We went everywhere. I bet you saw parts of this state you'd never seen before. Uh, and we went everywhere. And, uh, well, Nelson was, well, I'm not going to tell that one, but N Nelson was the chair of the committee. It was quite interesting as we went out. But we had huge crowds. At first we thought nobody was going to come in. Really, I think that helped members buy in. When you actually go out and see the facilities, now we don't talk about facilities a lot of times. A lot of times we're just talking about the care portions of uh, funding, but the facilities, the comparison between the facilities that people had in rural areas compared to what they had in some of the richer districts was astounding to me. I grew up in Cumberland County, one of the smallest counties uh, in, in Kentucky. We have 8,000 people and 10 last names. And, uh, <laughs> So, uh, and I love it. My dad was the principal and, you know, I was a school board lawyer there and everything, but I was astounded. So that really helped educate the General Assembly, all of us, as to what people were facing in the classroom, the facilities they were doing with, what sort of terrain they had to take their buses across, and all those sort of, all those things really helped, David. And one of the things, that, that exact tour, I remember it as well as I can remember anything, and you'll remember this. We went into a science classroom in a rural district in, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and in the science classroom was a Bunsen burner and a set of encyclopedias. The set of encyclopedias were pre-World War II. There was nothing even in the encyclopedia about World War II because they were published before that, and the Bunsen burner. And that was the entire science lab for a science classroom in, in a rural Kentucky um, county. And it's just, it, that, I think we all understood then from the perspective of unconscionability mm -hmm. that that was just utterly unconscionable and that there was no way people could get equal education. I had great teachers when I was growing up. I might not reflect, I might not reflect that I had great teachers. But I will tell you that virtually none of those teachers came from anywhere else. Uh, they, they weren't going to, I mean, usually if you went to Bowling Green or uh, Richmond or Lexington and you had a, your first glass of wine and a steak, you didn't want to come back to Berksville. And so the people that we had that came back were from there. And that was in all the rural areas. The other thing that we had is that because of the discrimination or the perce perceived discrimination, uh, against women in other workplaces, we had a lot of women that were teaching in, in, in topics and that go into other professions now. And uh, a lot of, uh, not, not that any profession's more important than other, but we know that some people get paid more if they're physicians and scientists and engineers and that sort of thing. So they were able to bridge that gap for a while, but these problems became evident to everyone. And although 
the governor wanted to cut everybody out and wanted just to deal with the leadership. I think that this trip that Nelson and some of those folks, I guess Roger No would have been the chair of the House committee then. He was one so of the all of this was taking place before you voted? Oh, oh yes. This, so, was, this so, was taking place before the decision. Sure. I mean, there was something going to have to be done because the reforms that had passed in 85 and 86 were going to have to be funded or nothing else, or they were going to right. bring it to a grind and halt. There wasn't consensus among Democrats. The Republicans were gleefully waiting uh, to see if there was going to be a tax increase and they mm -hmm. might ride into town in an anti-tax wave. Uh, very few were interested and quite frankly the way the system was not everyone was treated the way David uh, treated the curriculum co co committee people. Uh, they didn't really consult very much with the minority members. There were like eight or nine, there were probably eight Republicans mm -hmm. at, at the time. What to, getting to that We were divided was, three to three with two swing votes yeah. in our caucus. <laughs> so the Republicans were saying all these that you were talking about, but yet they weren't necessarily willing to vote for the tax increases that would make CARA operational, except for you and how many others? Well, there were three of us. Uh, there were three of us. Um, uh, Walter Baker and uh, Gene... Gene Gene, Gene Stewart, those are three, three of us. Well, you know, it, and, and it would have been... to your point that we were talking about earlier, did anybody suffer any kind of electoral repercussions because of that vote that was seen as courageous that you and three others took? Well, I actually thought it was probably my... I had been one term in the House, and I thought I was serving my only term in the Senate, if you'd heard it, listened to it in our caucus. But it would have been unconscionable for me, and I still catch flack over it. I was over there the other day for the 20th anniversary of my becoming Senate president. I know that's not a day you celebrated, but I started. Um, but, if, uh, you'd, if you'd send me an invite, I would. I'd, yeah. you know, I need to remember the date. Well, the, I'm kind of like you. They've lost my address. This is a, <laughs> You know how that happens to you. But um, after I looked at the numbers... And after I looked at what the SEEK formula was going to do and how we were going to, for the first time, do a legitimate inventory of all of the buildings and facilities that we had and designate them as permanent or transitory or, you know, as neat, and what kind of funding. And Forrest Kugel, I don't know whether any of you remember Forrest. He was a, he was a superintendent in Frankfurt and a couple other places. He had to explain to me, David, every session about those three nickels. You know, it's one nickel you do this and one nickel you do that. And so I'd start every session by calling Superintendent uh, Forrest. And I said, Forrest, now explain those nickels to me again. But it, it, I don't see how I could have not voted for it, mm -hmm. you know, considering the uh, funding level and the fact that the n amount of assets that we have down. And there were a lot of portions of it that I didn't like. But collectively, most of those, there had to be an accountability for the, for the, for the donor counties. There had to be the belief that we were, you were going to get something for the money mm -hmm. that was going to be sent. There was a whole harmless clause in there for the, for the wealthy counties that they would not be punished and that they would, uh, over a four-year period, would continue to receive at least as much and maybe 8% more. So got 8% more in every county. So it wasn't like that. But we were on a death spiral as far as funding was concerned. Uh, it wasn't really a very hard decision for, for me to make because the oil boom was going on in Berksville at the time, and I would have made a lot more money if I'd stayed at home anyway. But uh, I immediately after I voted for that, um, I, I was uh, taken out of the leadership position in my party. I was in the leadership position, and the redistricting took place a year or two after that. I lost all my counties. I, Cumberland County was the only county I had left. They took the Republicans did a deal with the Democrats, and the Republicans were going to get rid of me. And they also took all my committee assignments. And but I was fairly happy because I thought, well, I'll just well filing deadline day came up, and a, a gentleman from and they took me from Cumberland County to Whitley County, one county all the way across the line there, there. And it ended up being a tremendous district for me because people in Whitley County were never in competition from Cumberland County or Clinton County on things to do. So it was really a great district. But they, they recruited my, my minority leader, uh, recruited someone to come up to file against me from Whitley County. He was from a prominent family, well-known, and he got up there. But nobody told him that he had to bring two people to sign his papers with him. <laughs> so he got up there. Uh, and he didn't have anybody to sign, and they panicked, and they called down there, and they figured that the filing deadline had been, thank goodness, had been moved to four, 
And they couldn't get anybody up there. So the, I don't know whether it's uh, providential that I was still there or whatever, but uh, the next day was a very strutty day for me. You know, uh, I came in and said to, to the leadership officer, well, you know, I'm unopposed. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, but I really, really, I don't really think, I think Gene Stewart was probably the only person that, that this uh, had an electoral effect on. And I don't know that it did on him. He had a very strong candidate recruited against him. Might have beat him anyway. You agree? I, I think, think there was very little repercussion. The only one I heard much about was uh, down in Paducah, um, the senator from Paducah. The fe Helen Garrett. Helen Garrett from Paducah. Uh, they, there are some people who say she got some repercussions over the thing. I don't know what that – but – by and large, most even of the political, even people like Al Cross mm -hmm. and people who are politically making commentary uh, ended up saying there was very little. I was afraid you were going to say astute, but you said oh, yeah. okay. No, uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> but no, I think there were, the repercussions were pretty minimal. One of the things that really is uh, important to point out about this, the whole vote situation was, and going back to something that David said during Martha Lane's what used to occur in the legislature would be there would be these promotional things to elevate education and make the situation better, and that would be in one piece of the legislation. And then the, there was a theory that raising revenue could not be part of uh, a bill that did these other things. Mm -hmm. And so you, would get, you could get somebody who would gleefully vote for all these improvements and then the bill came on the floor for the money, and they fled. Uh, so a specific design took place to, on education reform was to marry the funds together with the bill. Mm -hmm. And so that if you, you weren't going to get away with your, you know, right. sneaky little act to go back and tell everybody you were really strong for public education, but oh, by the way, you didn't vote for anything. And we, vote, we, we wrapped them together and used the Rose decision uh, as, the, as the, the belief in methodology that we could get away with one bill that did all these things because it declared the whole system unconstitutional oh, yeah. and it said the General Assembly's sole responsibility was to recreate this entire system you cannot recreate an entire system if you don't have a funding mechanism for the system. And so there's never been a challenge, I don't think, David, you're, you're in the judiciary ever to the issue the way we did that mm -hmm. to wrap them in one bill. But that was a, a thing we had to do or we would have had some problem getting some of the votes. I'm curious. Well, I think there was a certainty that, that the Supreme Court was going to stick. And already, you know, I mean, they were, right. they were, they were going to stick because they, they didn't want this deal either. They didn't want to have to make the decision where they were going. The next step would have been, undoubtedly, that someone would have continued the suit, and there were subsequent suits, to force the General Assembly to the deal with the issue of adequacy. And although this alludes to, the Rose decision alludes to adequacy, it talks more about equity and talks about what sort of system. It doesn't say where you have to get the money because there are other places, as Governor Wilkinson I, as I was reviewing, one of the things he did, and this will be popular to bring up, I guess, but what, there, there used to be an overfunding of the, of the pension system every year up to that point. But Governor Wilkinson took that money, and in his book he talks about it's about $80 million, David, if I remember. In order to balance his budget and provide some funding, he took that money because he said the actuary said that the pension system was going to be fine. Now, some people said he took the money out of the budget, out of the pension plan. That's not true. He did not take the money. It was an overfunding that they were doing that he failed to fund. And, and after that got out of the system, it n never really got back in. Remember that? Yeah. I was going to ask if during that time in the late 80s and 90s, there was the charter school movement was emerging at that time. Michi uh, Minnesota, I think, was the first state to sign into a, a charter school law in 1991. And I'm just curious, that, were you hearing about this kind of free market idea that that could improve public education in a way that the government could not? And did that inform your approach to reform in any way? I, I will tell you from my perspective, and David, maybe during 1990s when all this was going on, there and yes, there those of us who were paying attention to education, there were some charter issues. But at that point in 
in this dialogue and at this time there was no real dis there was no real discussion of any significant nature about go dealing with charter schools that that has come subsequently if you ask me no, but we were a petri dish for educational ideas i mean they were just everywhere and you know we had the career ladder and we had all these sort of things going on and uh, talking about different differentiated pay and differential pay and how you incentivize and of course the governor uh, one of the things that we probably need to allude to is the most important thing you can do if you're doing a reform thing is to set the predicate out in the public. The second most important thing, and maybe the first, is to make sure your consultant gets chosen so that you're, that you're in a court with your consultant because a consultant working with a very fine Legislative Research Commission staff, and they deserve a lot of credit for the positive things that happen in the legislature, they work together and that's how you influence ultimately what's in there. The other thing that I, uh, uh, Senator Karam mentioned was they divided into governance, curriculum, and finance. Now what that does is it makes it look like everybody's collectively making a decision, right. but it's easier to control the group if they don't see what each other group is doing. And I've really, that's the difference between using a task force and the education committees, and Governor Wilkinson believe very strongly, and I did too, that it would have been impossible to have these discussions in the legislative committees to, to have it because pretty much everybody had their mind made up about where they thought they were coming from. And I've always said about the General Assembly that the greatest law of nature that you have in any legislative body, and it's a school board too, you all are legislative bodies, is inertia that things want to stay where they are and it's harder to move things. And thank God that it is hard to move things because they keep you from unintended consequences. So that was an important factor too. And the governor and the legislative leadership pretty much agreed upon the consultants. And the consultants, I think, were open to everyone. You agree with that? Absolutely, we had, a, we had a guy named David Hornbeck who was, we picked very carefully, did a national search for the curriculum committee, and he was really the guy that helped create the entire structure that we went through. He was a wonderful consultant. Yeah. So one of the things that's bedeviled maybe care or just our public education system in K through 12 entirely is accountability. And the accountability system assessment, uh, and I do want you to talk about how CARA impacted the approach to assessing what kids should be taught, what they learn and retain, and the testing thereof. <laughs> What, what, what they, what, what, I, one thing that I've saved, I've, I've thrown out recently a lot of s stuff because I'm an elder statesman, so I've been throwing a lot of crap away. One thing I've, one thing I have uh, kept is my original copy of the Rose decision, which now is very yellow and uh, crackly paper, but um, the, I always thought that the, from the accountability perspective, that, uh, and you all, I, as I understand it, you guys have spent a year working on studying on the Rose decision. So uh, there, there were like five pages in the Rose decision to me that really were the, were the uh, crux of the whole thing that talked about, and it started on page 57A or 58A, and it talks about what the system has to be like. And it was very directive about what capacities people had to have. And it was, and it was very directive on how you had to accomplish some of these things. So um, I thought the craftsmanship of some of this language was the perfect blueprint for how we needed to deal with these issues. And so if you haven't, if you haven't read page 58A through like 60 or 61, those are they're just beautifully crafted pages that talk about the accountability and what has to be in it and what you expect from kids. Well, there's no doubt that the Franklin Circuit Court even had set up their own advisory committee. Uh, Colonel Alexander and some other folks had been on the advisory committee to advise the circuit judge about it. And obviously there were other uh, advice. Nobody, no, no legal scholar wrote these things. These were from educational consultants and people that ha had, had their mindset. But this accountability thing, uh, I had someone stop me the other day, said, well, I see that you're gonna be up at the State School Board Association. And they said, we haven't seen you out speaking anywhere. I said, well, this is the first appearance that I've made anywhere to talk about any public topic in seven and a half years when I took the bench. 
And uh, I just don't, my dad, may he rest in peace, said that he was a former basketball coach. And he said when a coach or a preacher leaves the place, they shouldn't go back and criticize. So I've intentionally stayed away from a lot of these issues. But this accountability issue and the testing issue, uh, this guy came up and said, well, David, the only two things that are left from the Kentucky Education Reform Act are seek and, uh, and, and some of the aspects of that and the anti-nepotism sort of situations that are there as far as the school board members and the superintendents. That's about all that's School council. And site-based decision-making. He did mention that, too. Uh, family resource and youth service centers, he mentioned that. But if you look, you have to look at the time we're doing. Everybody's wanting to do these career ladders. Everybody's wanting to talk about taking over school systems that weren't performing well. The, the people in my area uh, were concerned about that, and I said, don't worry. If they take your school system over, they'll give it back soon enough. <laughs> you know, when they, they'll, they, they won't have any more insight in it th than you do. But what, what they, the worst mistake that I think that we made, and I worked a lot to try to correct this, and really some of us that voted for this, that were invested in it, worked together across party lines for years, uh, Harry Moberly and other gr gr guys that were there, we would, when we would see something that we thought that was, you know, just counterproductive, but when they decided to 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 have uh, uh, rewards and sanctions, I was very vocal at that particular point, and I said the worst sanction should be the lack of a reward, because we're too tentative in how we're making these judgments about how these people are performing, and I don't think I understood at the time was the I forget all these acronyms. But was the first one the Kiris test? Kiris. Was that was the first one? Then cats. Then cats and all those other different. Uh, but in any event, when you decide that you're going to teach, you're going to test certain grades of children, and you're not teaching, you're not testing the progress that anyone made with the same child. And you know, we all know especially that there are some classes of kids that might be brighter than some other, it might be better performing. But to test these groups to see how the fourth grade's doing and test them three years later, it just didn't work. And, and we were making decisions and then putting the money over there and letting people decide how they were going to do it, which was a, a disaster on letting people decide who they were going to share it with. But that came because of the career ladders and all the other things and differentiated pay. It, it was a good attempt, but uh, it was a mistake. The other thing that I hear people talking about is we didn't fund full day kindergartens. It was alluded to. Well, I was there when that discussion was going on and the superintendents that were there wanted more latitude. And so one of the way, well, way we got them some latitude is we'll go ahead and, and require a half day funding and then out of the additional money you can get, you can fund that. Well, not a lot of them did because they felt their need was someplace else. Some of these school districts got 25% more money a year. We spread it out over four years so they wouldn't, you know, they do it. Very few of them decided to reduce class size. Most all of them put all of it into teacher salaries. And I'm not saying that the teacher salaries weren't worthy to do that sort of thing, but some of these other shortcomings, people decided when they set their priorities at the local legislative level, the school board, it wasn't that big a priority to them compared to what we did. And so that, that's the perspective that, you, that, you, that I had on the time. And the testing was end up being, in my opinion, a disaster the way we did it. And there's been some improvement. The worst part of it is that the tests we gave were not statistically valid to impact any individual child. Isn't that what this is all about? You know, to find out how every individual child is doing. And that, those tests didn't do that. Yeah, one, one of... One of the, D David brings up the, a very important topic and that's this testing. One of the, th this is just a funny antidote. The whole, you know, the Keras test was like people were going crazy. And so we had to, go, we went through this whole thing to redo the Keras test. And so we came up with the idea, I mean, make no mistake about, there was a lot of time spent coming up with the CATS test with the belief that if we called it the CATS test, <laughs> that nobody in the Commonwealth of Kentucky could be against the CATS <laughs> test. Except if you were a L fan, maybe. Um, well, in the Kentucky General Assembly, 
cat's test would sell a lot better than <laughs> Cardinal's <than> <laughs> test. <laughs> so in your capacity as uh, Senator Karam, Chairman Karam, I'm not sure what to call you, uh, the board right uh, now. David would be really David's good. David's fine. Well, I'll have to look at you and call you David since there's two of you. Um, you know, you're dealing with a lot at the board level, uh, and I want you to kind of put that in perspective, all your years in the General Assembly, now being charged with a second run here as board chair, um, the issues of education that you see most pressing that lawmakers should either set some policy for or let local districts do. Well, I, 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 I would say that what the current Board of Education feels, and the same, the seven years that I was on the Board of Education before feels is exactly what David Williams just talked about, that every, it, it is about every individual child, and we should be working as hard as it's possible to work at, for all of us involved in public education in the Commonwealth, uh, for for a system that deals with that, that makes sure every child is um, uplifted, that, that is the boat lifts up, all the kids are lifted up. And so trying to make sure that the system works for every kid is the big challenge. I mean, and that's the, but it ought to be, it ought to be the mantra from all of us that it is and that David is right. It's about every single kid and how do we, give them the best education that's possible because, and, and fa frankly, come on, you all know it or you wouldn't be spending your time in it. It's, what, it's the most important thing we do as a legislature. It's the most important thing we do as a commonwealth. It's the most important job that anybody has to do in state government is to make sure the number one thing is we have the best possible education system for every kid in the commonwealth of Kentucky. And the opposite end of that is you end up seeing somebody like a Judge David Williams, because if you don't perhaps get it on the front end with education, then the correction system could be in the path of some children. So I want well, to, since well, you've kind of come full circle, I want you to kind of put that in perspective. Well, let's face it. Our teachers are not faced with the same population that they would have been when I was in elementary school. There are many, many, many more problems. And... Uh, uh, the, the, it, I had a rule day in one of my counties yesterday, and I was a criminal defense lawyer. I had someone stop me out here. Well, the first thing they said to me is, you used to be David Williams, didn't you? <laughs> and I thought, well, there's probably more truth to that than I would like to admit. But, but I was telling them, you know, the, I thought I knew the problems that people went through uh, as a criminal defense lawyer, but then I started thinking about the people that could afford to hire me had a support system around them. Now that I've become a circuit judge, I see them all. And I see people and their problems with their children. I, don't, I do dependency music and neglect things because we don't have a family court judge. I do a lot of these sort of things. It's unbelievable what teachers have to face and how little support they have from a lot of the parents that are there because, as we all know, they weren't successful in school either, a lot of them. So it's, it's a challenge. The Family Resource Centers and Youth Service Centers are, are part of that. I really just don't know sometimes. Uh, as I've gotten older, my faith has gotten stronger. And if I didn't have, if, if I, I go, I speak, the only places I speak are drug court graduations. And, it, and you see, these people do not want to be drug addicts, but they'll give up their children for that drug. They'll ignore their responsibilities. They'll lose their job. They'll lose their freedom. They'll lose their soul for that drug. And this is a societal issue that, unfortunately, education gets put in the middle of. And I, I, I remember we saw the beginning of it, and I guess there's always been an extent, is we said that one of the things they said in care is that no child and no school can be successful without the involvement of parents. And I had them to amend that a little bit, but should be prepared to act in the absence thereof. And that's the challenge that I see that we have from here on out. It's a societal, so many single parent households, uh, so much poverty, so much drug use. Uh, people don't have strong convictions about things. And I'm not talking about whether you're Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or or Muslim or Jewish. I'm not talking about that. There just seems there's not strong convictions and beliefs. And we live in a hostile political environment 
in this country. Um, when I was president of the Senate, people, some people thought I was hostile. But I will tell you that I would never have allowed people on the floor of the Kentucky State Senate to make the comments and the disparaging personal comments. Or I would have never allowed staff members to, to say what I hear people say all the time now. It's a, it's a period of disrespect and it's a problem. But I don't know, I don't know uh, what we do about this except you all are on the front line. I will tell you that we have different sorts of school board members and different sorts of principals than we would have had. My dad was a great basketball coach and became a principal, but that's not the route to become a principal anymore. That's probably a good thing, that, not that there aren't coaches that made great principals. And people that were on the school boards in our areas were more interested in patronage than they were in education. And that's not true anymore, and, and that's a good thing also. So that portion of the governance has been very important. You know, one of the, I'm glad you brought up that issue, one, and this, I don't want anybody on the school board to th throw anything at me, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the big issues was nepotism. One of the things that we talked a lot about was nepotism and how to deal with nepotism, and, one of the, and there was significant reform, I think you will agree, on this issue of nepotism in, in the, all the legislation that came out, and one of the at the conclusion of most of the stuff, we had a big two-day hearing uh, that literally started at 9 in the morning, went till 6 in the evening for two days, so anybody could come forward. And, um, at, and at that time, um, we were really struggling with this issue of nepotism and trying to, trying to make it very strong. And uh, I will never forget that the, a person representing the Kentucky School Boards Association came up to the microphone and said uh, that we couldn't, you can't be for this nepotism legislation that you have in the bill because 50% of my board members will not be able to seek a re-election to the board. And there was utter dead silence in the room and if I could read a crowd, the crowd in that room was saying, you've just made the case for the nepotism piece. And that everybody on the panel who was sitting there looked at each other and said exactly the same thing. You just made the case about, so uh, don't hit me if you don't agree with that <laughs> well, position. Well, we've, we've had to back off some of the, uh, down through the years, backed off some of the nepotism situation because, quite frankly, there are some families that are involved, are educators, and they go away and maybe they marry at school or someplace, and if we're lucky, they'll bring a chemistry teacher back home with them or something, you know, and, and the way our system is set up, you can't advance financially by staying in the classroom. So, so many people are forced out of the classroom into instructional supervisors or principal's positions or those sort of things. And then all of a sudden, we were going to disqualify the chemistry teacher. You know, the, the other thing that I think, and I'm going to make a pitch here. Uh, I don't know whether you agree with this or not agree. One of the biggest ripoffs that we have, and it's existed all the time, and it's an excuse for a bunch of this college loan, is making people get masters and rank one degrees and think and paying all this money to these universities that probably the money would be better spent if people did symposiums and learned their language and that sort of thing if they wanted to get masters in their field but is it right that people have to their own money have to pay for master's degrees and rank one to advance financially I mean what other what other profession has to do that you know? I was just getting ready to ask you you said you're not in the business of uh telling the General Assembly what to do now that you're out of it, but you were in it for a very long time, and I'm curious about what you would advise them to do, particularly as they're crafting a budget right now. The House is doing their markup, and the Senate will do it and get it to the well, governor. Well, I will tell you that uh, the former governor is a prime example of how you can do a lot of things financially correct and let your mouth not get any support for it. Uh, I mean... That, I will tell you, there are two things that bother me right now, and uh, not everybody might agree. Well, there was always, uh, and I've talked to the three superintendents in, in, from my area about this, we always had to watch money being passed outside of the SEEK system. And the first thing I noticed about this budget recommendation that the governor has is that this 
80 something million or 90 something million dollars a year for the $2,000 a year pay raises that were, mm -hmm. uh, is a line item appropriation and is going to go outside of the, the seat. If that happens, what we did when we passed Kentucky Education Reform Act is we made sure we put enough money inside the SEEK system to, to do the pay raises that when we took the schedule up. Now, what's going to happen in the future is from here on out, that $80 million is going to have to continue to be a line item appropriation in every budget if it goes outside the SEEK, if you walk up. And that further disequalizes uh, the, the, the seek formula, that, that, that's a problem as far as I'm concerned. And the other problem uh, th that I see coming up is the cost of health care and the cost of funding these pensions means that the, the, the portion, the, if you look at the actual increase of money that's spent for education, it's far exceeded any inflation. And you can agree or disagree with that, but you don't have to write the checks for the pension part of it. Once your people go out, you send those numbers up there, and from then on out, that money is paid by the state into the pension fund. Well, think about this. That money also goes outside of the SEEK formula. So if you have these districts that have all these high paid, higher paid people or bunches and bunches of administrators that retire in a teacher retirement system, that consumes more and more money that could go into the SEEK system. And the cost of health care uh, is tremendously going up. It's a tremendous benefit. And then the other thing that you have is the expansion of Medicaid, mm -hmm. which has no end in sight. The federal government now is, uh, I could go into uh, about whether you have to be categorically eligible for Medicaid, disabled like you have to, or whether you're just eligible for it because of your income. How many people, in, if you go to a hospital now, you go in and say, I, I'm presenting myself. Do you have insurance? No. And I'm afraid, I believe I have more than anecdotal information. Well, you don't make more than 39000 or whatever the amount is a year because if you don't make more than that, we can give you Medicaid. Well, I don't make any more than that. No. So they get signed up. Okay. The physicians aren't getting reimbursed in an adequate amount, but more and more and more money. So the reason I say that is that Medicaid portion of the budget's there, it's growing and growing. The education portion of the budget's getting more expensive, but less of it's gonna go through SEEK and more of it. And we've got a, I, I noticed all these contractors out, out here. I, I, old superintendents don't fade away, they work for consulting companies. <laughs> um, but in any event, we got a lot of we've got a lot of unmet need in buildings today because a lot of these buildings are 25 years old now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, so it, it, it. What about the maintenance and those and, and whether uh, how many school systems have been able to put kind of a sinking fund away to replace those buildings or what's going to happen to those when they all hit at once? Those problems bother me as far as the financial future of our state. And we haven't had anybody that goes out and sets the predicate to change our tax structure. Governor Wilkinson, to his credit, I think was a visionary on it. He didn't want to take the rate up. He wanted to spread the base. Mm -hmm. And uh, when in my, I know, thank you for not mentioning that I got the heck beat out of me in the governor's race. I appreciate that. Of it. But during the governor's race, I kept on talking about the number of people that we had that were not in the workforce mm -hmm. and the growth that I saw in Tennessee and all my counties. Now you can like it or not like it. You go down to Nashville and compare it to Louisville now. You go to any of those cities down there all across Tennessee and I believe a lot has to do with their tax structure because they tax consumption and not productivity. So if, you, if you're a teacher out there, if you're a teacher out there, you pay taxes on every dime you make. If you're uh, pin hooking uh, oak logs, or if, if you're a fence or selling drugs, you don't pay taxes on anything. So unless we do something about our tax structure, we'll never have enough money to meet the pension problem, the educational needs, and the healthcare needs of Kentuckians. That's what I worry about. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things we've not talked about that we, that we should talk a little bit about real quick, I don't know how much time we have left, but that was education minutes. reform, uh, uh, 
was sustained initially because of major corporate support. Mm -hmm. The business community of this Commonwealth, uh, David Jones from Humana, John Hall from uh, the uh, Ashland Oil, uh, Oz Nelson from, uh, the, from UPS, those people stood up and said that it was critically important for the, for the business community to support this effort and to sustain the effort and to be there and to be there in perpetuity. One of the things that I personally think do not see in this time right now was anywhere near the business, the major businesses standing up for the importance of public education. I don't see that anything like back in the David Jones, Oz Nelson, John Hall era where they stood up and said that it, they had this responsibility to do that. Anecdotally, someone will tell you that in fact what has happened is uh, after they made this initial corporate uh, don't, uh, payments that their uh, well-qualified lawyers have uh, systematically figured out how to make an end run around all of these things and so corporate support to the budgets is significantly less than what it was at the time education reform was adopted and I think that's a problem for the whole state that we all need to that we need to address. But the business interests have been able to successfully push their agenda on education, right? Because of the emphasis now on workforce development, increasing the workforce participation rate, even though they may not be investing financially, certainly their policy positions are making great inroads in the Kentucky General Assembly. Well, the thing about it, and I think Senator Cameron is exactly right, they started penciling immediately. The decisions that these giants made, and they were corporate giants, were not particularly popular with the tax with their shareholders when tax time came around, and they got a lot of blowback after it was over, and you had people threatening to relocate, and I will tell you, most every one of those individuals that you've mentioned are gone, mm -hmm. and the people that own those companies are in a hedge fund somewhere, because the local ownership of banks and some of these major corporations does not exist any longer. And uh, so, so that's a problem. That's the reason that I think that uh, you have, I, I will say something else Governor Wilkinson uh, said. When he talked about doing something about the tax structure, he talked about the deductions and the exemptions, which we in the business call tax expenditures. And you've seen that book. There's a big tax expenditure book. The issue will be when some governor or when some legislative body has enough courage to take those tax expenditures and do away with all of them and make somebody come back and justify all those. I'm not saying they're all not justified, but justify those compared to the benefit that would come from the money they would generate if they weren't in place. See, that's the decision. When one of these exemptions or exceptions is passed, it's the same as an appropriation. It's the same as that company getting, now they'll say, well, we're letting them keep their own money. Well, we might be letting them keep their own money, but if, you, if that's a problem, lower the rate for everyone. And that sort of open discussion was completely absent, no criticism, in the last administration. And I don't know whether this administration will be any different or not, whether this governor will be, will, will be willing to take risk or not whether with a, a legislature of the different party, completely different party, they can work out some accord. But I will tell you that on this pension issue and on these tax issues, someone needs to go out and set the predicate and be honest with the people of Kentucky and accept their capacity to do what they did with the Kentucky Education Reform Act, and that is give it a chance. Because unless you if, you, if you treat people like mushrooms and keep them in the dark, they lose the credibility. You've got to give them the options that they have. Somebody needs to do that. And we should note that Senator Williams was one of the first, or the first, to sound the alarm about the public pension system back in the mid-2000s, correct? Well, two, I mean, the leaky two, bucket report came out from the chamber, but you had said before. 2003... Um, I will tell you something. Uh, I thought I knew something about the General Assembly and the process, 
But till you're in the majority and you have the additional staff, David, you'll agree with that. You know, there are a lot of things that you don't know about that. And I started doing the numbers on this pension, and I was out to dinner with uh, Secretary Chow and, and Leader McConnell, and she was talking about the private pension guarantee fund. And I said, well, the private pension guarantee fund? And we started talking, so I, that was about 2002 or something, I started looking at it. And I said, geez, you know, look at this thing and look at, look, look at what's happening to it. And, but it, it came to the point, somebody said uh, the other day, one of the Republicans that's over in the legislature, who's not a big David Williams fan, which joined the majority of people in Commonwealth Kentucky, um, <laughs> said to me, well, why didn't you do something about this? And I said, well, we tried to do something about it, but I tell you, the, this pension is just like a tax expenditure. If, you, if we had taken the money out, if we could accomplish it, and the legislature always put more money in the pension than any governor appropriated. without. But if we had taken that money out uh, of these other programs, you would have had to close your school systems down. There wasn't ever enough money there. The money wasn't stolen from the pension funds. As a matter of fact, the only money that we ever borrowed from any pension entity is we did borrow money from the health care side of it because the federal law does not allow you to uh, mix and mingle the pension side and the health insurance side of a pension fund, thank God. So we borrowed that money, but when we paid it back, we paid it back at 10% interest and the pension fund did not lose the downturn. In other words, if we'd left all that money in there, they would have suffered the downturn in the economy. Not only did they not suffer the downturn in the economy, but they made 10% on every year that we had it. So they made money uh, on that thing. So it's never been funded appropriately. Uh, we've had misrepresentations. It couldn't have been funded at the level. It still needs to be changed. Whoever made the decision and I'm sure they were well intended, not to allow teachers to participate in Social Security was a terrible, terrible, terrible decision. But it's made, and there doesn't seem to be any way to, to get around it. You know, so uh, th that's very problematic. Uh, and, and I did recognize it, but I wasn't strong enough to do anything about it. And I will tell you this. Uh, a couple of times I felt very strongly about things, and I locked the place down. Really, ultimately, the only way either House or the Senate, and it happened when the Democrats were in a majority in both sides, and it's going to happen when the Republicans are both sides. You know, Republicans don't like Democrats. Democrats don't like Republicans somewhat, but no senator likes any representative. <laughs> And, 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 and all representatives really resent all senators because we've got four-year terms. Uh, but so when, when you get down to doing this sort of thing, uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing when someone, when a governor proposes a budget and we say, no, we're not going to put that money in the SEEK formula. Or we're not going to fund Medicaid to that level. We're going to take that money and pay for the pension system. Now, how much political benefit do you get from funding the pension system at the highest level ever? Ask Governor Bevin. I mean, it was part of his doing, but he put more money in the pension system ever. Nobody appreciates that's the money he's already entitled to. So you don't get that. You don't get anything for something that's already in the baseline. You don't get any political punch. But if he did, one of the big, oh, the funniest thing, uh, in 85, 86, they gave the teachers a $300 raise. Remember that for taking that test? <laughs> Governor Wilkinson didn't give them the $300 raise. But he gave him, he helped fund a $2,000 raise, or more than that for some people, 20% 20, 20 raise. But they were still hacked off about the $300. <laughs> so it's just a matter of, a, you know, it was kind of like the guy that said, you tell somebody there's 20 billion stars in the sky, and they'll believe that, but you tell them that that paint is wet on that bench, and they'll want to go over there and touch it. <laughs> and uh, that's the way the budget process is, you know? I mean, yeah. well, you, oh, you know, I, I know our insurance costs more. I know our pensions cost more. I know we're triple the amount per pupil that we're spending, but that doesn't matter. Well, it does matter unless they come up with a source of funding beyond what they have. Yeah. Senator Cameron, I want to ask you as we kind of wrap up, um, if you could give some advice 
to your former uh, colleagues there in the General Assembly as they are in this budget session and looking at supporting public education. What would you say? <laughs> Take off your education, your commissioner or your uh, Do they have hat. to confirm members of the board? That's what I'm on. Yeah, <laughs> right? They can fire. This, what they what can you say fire, in this room stays in this me. room. What you say in here stays in here. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I can be gleefully fired. I've uh, 33 years in the legislature, seven previously on the Board of Education. That's 40. Mm -hmm. I got into this thing as being chair of the state board because the governor asked me to do it this one time for another couple of years. And if uh, tomorrow morning, if it's um, if a federal court disbands us, or if uh, they go, don't confirm me, I will sleep like a baby tomorrow night. <laughs> but in advice, well, I think the advice to, and, and I think David Williams and I would probably both agree, the, the most, imp I just have to keep saying this, the most important thing the General Assembly can do is fund and create a system of common schools that uplifts every child in the Commonwealth, regardless of region, regardless of race, regardless of uh, family uh, stability or otherwise. It is the job of the General Assembly to put aside, and I think I think this is where there was, you know, there was a guy named Tom Clark. Tom is one of the preeminent Kentucky historians. If anybody has any interest in Kentucky history, you need to familiarize yourself with Tom Clark. Tom Clark said the finest thing that was done in the last century in the Commonwealth of Kentucky was the Kentucky education reform. And so the challenge is to continue to make the most important thing we do in the Commonwealth is the next generation. And they, they, it is everything. And David has pointed out some of these challenges. It is a different generation. But that does, what, what that means is we must figure out and double down to make sure every kid's taken care of. So that my message to the General Assembly would be um, read the Constitution one more time, read the Rose decision one more time, and do what uh, your, when you swore that oath, um, that's what you're there to do, is to make that system work. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you, I agree with that. But I'm going to tell you what, the decisions you make at the school board level will have more to do with the, what kind of education children get in the state than anything they can do in Frankfurt. And you, you need to always... So that's why you want them all to take the 4% every year. <laughs> well, it's a good deal. <laughs> uh, remember, yeah. David. Well, let, remember, me, let me tell remember, you something. No, wait a minute. Remember, you, you remember the four percent was put in as a punitive cap on growth. Before the four percent, they had much more ability to. So the four well, percent before, before House Bill Forty Four, there weren't a lot of problems. But I wasn't there when House Bill Forty Four was but, passed at Limpton. So but take I, the four percent. Yeah. <laughs> But I will tell you that nobody wants their bill number now to be House Bill 44. Lots of times it's a blank, uh, it's a blank jacket because that bill, which did to, I want to say something anecdotally, if I can, about my, my, pers and my personal life and the history of my family. Can I do that for sure, a minute? Yeah. I, I met where are any Logan County people here. Raise your hand. I bumped into some Logan County. My grandmother in 1910 uh, got on a steamboat and went. Uh, to Russell, to went to Logan's Girls Academy or Bethel College. It was kind of on the same thing. Her mother had died when she was small, and she had eight brothers and sisters. Her father was wealthy, but he did not see the benefit of a girl even doing much more than reading and writing. But her stepmother had appreciation for education and talked to my great-grandfather and allowed her to get on that steamboat and go down there and take a train to Bethel or or, or to Logan's Christian. She stayed down there as a boarding school for some time, played basketball, learned uh, education, and she moved back to Cumberland County where my grandfather had been uh, virtually orphaned. His father died. He went to the eighth grade uh, three times, not because he had a problem, but because he couldn't afford to come to town to go to high school. And they looked in the book of Daniel, 
and they got the word purposed, and they purposed themselves that their children would be educated. And all four of their children were college graduates. One of them was killed in World War II. And their grandchildren has a medical doctor, three lawyers, a PhD, a marine, a marine biologist. And every time I voted for anything over in Frankfurt, I just thought that some child that comes into the room might be Sally Smith Williams, that she has the potential or he has the potential to affect out. So thank you people, the, your ancestors in Logan County did my family a great favor and we each need to remember that when we make these decisions. Yeah. Good words to end on. Please give a round of applause to Judge Williams and Chairman Senator David Karam. Hey,